Good day, everyone. Buenos días. Today is the 20th of November, World Children's Day. Hoy es el 2 de noviembre, Día Universal del Niño. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals note that the children are critical agents of change and will find in the SDGs a platform to channel the infinite capacities for activism into creation of a better world. As adults, it is our responsibility to show how heritage, our cultural natural resources can support the SDGs in sustaining a liable and healthy planet. This week is also Climate Heritage Week, a global forum of arts, culture, heritage-based climate action. Our planet is without a doubt at a critical juncture and this is why we've been dedicated this webinar to our beautiful planet and the role of cultural heritage in building environmental resilience. We are delighted to have um, you join us today. I would like to excuse Linda Shetabi, who was our host, but couldn't join us. My name is Ona Vilekis. I am a member of the ECOMOS SDG Working Group and uh, co-chair of the ECOMOS GA 2020 and 2023 of the Scientific Symposia. Together with Roberta Malia, member of the ECOMOS International Scientific Committee on, on Energy, Sustainability and Climate Change, we will be moderating the webinar. So at the same time, I'll be moderating. I'll do my best to support the Spanish translations. You will find some words in the slides and the chat as well. This is the first time we are doing this. So not all will be translated, but please be patient uh, and let's enjoy it. Yo soy Ona Vilekis, miembro del Grupo de Trabajo de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible ODS y seré la moderadora hoy con Roberta Malia. Al mismo tiempo que moderaré, Haré todo lo posible para apoyar las traducciones en español. También encontrará algunas palabras en las diapositivas y en el chat, en los que están en, en, en Zoom. Esta es la primera vez que estamos haciendo esto, así que sean por favor pacientes y disfruten las presentaciones. As always, we will be covering a wide range of SDGs, including SDG 6, 7, 13, 14, and 15, reaffirming the interconnectivity of the SDGs and cultural heritage contribution to sustainable development across its various dimensions. Como siempre, cubriremos una gran amplia gama de los ODS, incluidos los ODS 6, 7, 13, 14 y 15, reafirmando la interconectividad de los ODS y la contribución del patrimonio cultural al desarrollo sostenible en sus diversas dimensiones. We have three wonderful speakers today, each discussing how cultural heritage serves as an asset to climate action, sustainable water, SDG 6, and energy management, sustainable land use and terrestrial ecosystems, and the sustainable management of oceans, land and sea. We will cover all. Hoy tenemos tres maravillosos presentadores, cada uno discutiendo cómo el patrimonio cultural sirve para la acción climática, la gestión del agua, el uso sostenible de la tierra y los ecosistemas terrestres, además de la gestión sostenible de océanos. Tierra y mar lo cubriremos todo. Our first speaker is Andrew Potts, coordinator for ECOMOS Climate Change and Heritage Working Group and the lead author of The Future of Our Past, Engaging Cultural Heritage in Climate Action. This report highlighted the ways in which cultural heritage can drive transformative climate action and catalog the many impacts climate change is having on our heritage. He previously served as Associate General Counsel of the US National Trust for Historic Preservation and received the National Trust John H. Caffey Trustees Award for Outstanding Achievement in Public Policy. Our next, next speaker is Chris Underwood, President of the ECOMOS International Committee on Cultural Underwater Cultural Heritage. Chris has extensive experience in maritime archaeology and is a fellow of the Nautical Archaeology Society. Since 2005, 
He has been a member of Argentina's National Institute of Anthropology's underwater archaeology team and has been a trainer for UNESCO capacity building programs in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia, contributing to and co-editing the associated manuals and is a member of the editorial board of the peer reviewed journal and maritime archaeology. And our final speaker is Nupur Prothi, lecturer, landscape architect, urbanist planner, and a heritage conservator professional who as an ECOMOS member has contributed and advised in international organizations such as the International Federation of Landscape Architects and the International Society of City and Regional Planners. She was the co-chair of the scientific symposium for the 2017 ECOMOS General Assembly in Delhi and is contributing to the scientific committee at the GA 2023 symposium. She has contributed to award-winning public projects and since moving to Estocolm in 2017, hopes to drive change in the field of water, heritage and sustainability. And before our webinar ends, we will be presenting a short video graciously provided by Mauro Garcia Santa Cruz, who is an architect, an academic, and the virtual education coordinator of the Heritage and Climate Change Initiative. He has been part of the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of La Plata, Argentina, and teaches landscape planning and environment at the Faculty of Agricultural and Forestry Science. He is also the founding partner of the Hobby Studio, Sustainable Architecture and Landscaping, and it is a member, he is a member of ECOMOS Argentina and the International Scientific Committee of Energy, Sustainability and Climate Change. Finally, our Facebook reactor today will be uh, Gabriel Caballero. He is the incoming focal point for the ECOMOS SDGs and member of ECOMOS ISC on Cultural Landscapes. So before we start, a few housekeeping tips. En español, pueden ver los eh, tips para proceder en este webinar en azul. Please mute your microphones and perhaps make, maybe turn off your videos as well. It, it, it will reduce bandwidth requirements and will prevent disruptions. For security reasons, please provide your full name and affiliation so we, we know who you are. And during the Q&A session at the end of the three presentations, so please add your comments and questions in the chat box. You will be also able to talk if you want uh, with the video. Alternative, you can also, if you are not able to provide um, your name, uh, please, um, you can also alternative watch this webinar via Facebook, live at the ECOMOS International Facebook page, where our expert reactor, Gabriel, can address your questions here. Of course, I would like to give a quick word of gratitude to our fabulous and hardworking coordinating team, Gabe, Roberta, Paolo, Maureen, and Eva, without whom this event would not be possible. And to finalize, um, I would like to say that um, the presentations, as I said, might be mixed. There's some uh, subtitle, some um, uh, words in Spanish um, as well, but we will also have um, Paolo at the end of each presentation, giving a short summary in Spanish or English, um, depending on the language it was, has been presented. So please let us enjoy. I will now give the word to Andrew Potts. Well, th thank you, Dr. Vieques, for that introduction and greetings all from New York State in the United States, where I am right now. As Ona said, um, I am the coordinator of the ECOMOS Climate Change and Heritage Working Group. Uh, I also serve as the coordinator of the Secretariat for the Climate Heritage Network. Uh, as you heard, this is Climate Heritage Week, an activity sponsored by the network. And so um, I'm pleased to bring greetings from the network as well. Uh, the network is a group of uh, hundreds of organizations from around the world that share a common commitment to the role of arts, culture, and heritage in climate action and ECOMOS happens to serve as the secretariat for the network. Just going to share my screen. Uh, there you go. Oh, 
Ona, do you see it? Perfect, thank you. Okay, good, thank you. So uh, I was asked to provide some introductory remarks for today's topic, the role of cultural heritage in building environmental resilience. And in a weak moment, uh, without giving it a lot of thought, I uh, sent to the organizers, to Gabe, the title of my talk. I said I was going to talk about the role of cultural heritage in addressing the planetary emergency. But now that today is here, I realize that that title is a little bit um, grandiose, may maybe over ambitious. Uh, I have to tell you that as I have worked now in at the intersection of environmental resilience and cultural heritage, uh, I feel like I have as many questions as answers uh, to this question, the role of cultural heritage in building environmental resilience. So I'm not sure I can really answer the question today. What I hope to do is at least give some topics, some considerations, uh, put them on the table for us all to um, debate together. For starters, I'd like to try to um, define what I mean by planetary emergency. What I'm referring to here is the combination of threats which together are imperiling the well-being of human communities and life on Earth. What are those threats? Things like rapid industrialization, wealth inequality, globalization, excessive and insensitive development, and unsustainable consumption and production patterns. One critical dimension of all of this, of course, is the climate emergency. Increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases driven by human activities like the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation are warming the planet, changing the climate, and increasing hazards to the point that ECOMOS has concluded that climate change is one of the most significant and fastest growing threats to people and their cultural heritage worldwide. At the same time, the ecosystems that underpin our well being are collapsing. Species are becoming extinct at an unprecedented rate. And so we see the parallels between the fate of humans and the fate of the rest of nature, all intertwined, or as we sometimes say, nature and culture linked. At the heart of all of this is the clash of immediate human needs with their long-term impacts on the planet's capacity to support life. What we need is often described as the ability to live in harmony with nature. In fact, that's the title of the strategic plan for uh, biodiversity 2011 to 2020 of the Convention on Biodiversity. That's the current framework that will be replaced next year with the new post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So having talked a little bit about uh, what I mean by planetary emergency, uh, I'd like to define another important term, and that's the word resilience. Resilience is in the title of today's webinar. It also appears throughout the SDGs, including several of the SDGs that we're talking about today. The word resilience appears in target 13.1, of the climate action goal of the SDGs and also in target 14.2 of life below water. The latest resilient science tells us that the concept has three key components. First, resilience means the capacity to transform. Second, resilience includes the capacity to persist. And third, resilience includes the capacity to adapt or adaptive capacity. So this is not exactly simply bouncing back from uh, adversity, as is sometimes said. I think it's uh, more accurate to summarize resilience as the ability to live with change. Resilient science also suggests some of the characteristics of resilient systems. And here again, we see the interlinkages between culture and the rest of nature, because we find common patterns between resilient human systems and resilient natural systems. There are many ways to describe the characteristics of resilient systems, but some of the recurring elements are the following. First, redundancy, which is to say the multiplicity of pathways. It means having multiple options in life, and that's true for species, but it's also true for social networks. Second, diversity. Diversity of knowledge systems, livelihoods, functions, and of course, biodiversity. And so here we start to see the linkages between cultural diversity and biodiversity as they both contribute to resilience. 
The next is modularity, which is a system property that measures the degree to which a network's interconnections can be decoupled into separate clusters or communities. And so what we're talking about here is the balance between the benefits and problems of interconnectedness, for example, globalism, with local self-sufficiency. A fourth dimension of resilience is equity and justice, which includes the degree to which the capabilities are distributed within a society. The more widely capabilities are distributed across a society, the more resilient that society is. And then finally, adaptive learning, which includes the ability to navigate adversity and brings in concepts like creativity and inspiration. So it's useful also to consider what resilience means specifically in the context of climate change. Climate science tells us that for every additional increment of global warming, there are severe consequences. Well, 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming will severely damage our natural and cultural heritage. The impacts of two degrees of warming will be significantly worse. Holding warming below 1.5 degrees requires rapid and far-reaching change to every sector of life. This is the transition to a green economy and decarbonization. And so what we're seeing is the idea of adapting to climate change, that is living with the change we've already caused because we've already warmed the planet one degree Celsius over pre-industrial levels. So we see that adapting to that change and the idea of mitigating that change, which is preventing more climate change by, by reducing greenhouse gases, those are ideas are merging into one. And we could call that a merger of adaptation and mitigation, resilience, which means the ability of society to make the transformative changes that we need to do to address climate change and doing it in a way that's both rapid and just. And so thusly understood, the concept of resilience is quite broad, broad enough that I think it actually supplies the answer to the rhetorical question that is the title of my talk. What is the role of cultural heritage in addressing the planetary emergency? Our role, broadly speaking, is to build resilience. And so assuming uh, you accept that idea for the moment, then that invites us to begin to examine every aspect of cultural heritage practice to see if it indeed does help society manage and deal with change, since managing change is essentially the definition of resilience. And so how does cultural heritage contribute to resilience? What aspects of cultural heritage promote redundancy of social networks, diversity of knowledge systems, local self-sufficiency, equity and distribution of capabilities, and adaptive learning? Of course, every aspect of cultural heritage can contribute to these um, dimensions of resilience. But if there is one category of cultural heritage that I would say is most often cited as supporting resilience, it's the idea of traditional knowledge. I, I think it's important to note that if you read the Convention on Biodiversity, the word culture does not appear in that document, but it does have a very important section, 8J, which calls for respect, preservation, and maintenance of knowledge, innovation, and practices of indigenous and local communities embodying traditional lifestyles. So we see from the CBD that their conception of the role of cultural heritage in environment is in the field of knowledge, also livelihoods. Many of you will know about the 2010 Declaration on Biocultural Diversity and the joint program of work between UNESCO and the CBD that was a decade long effort to strengthen the, leak, the links between biological and cultural diversity. And the joint work program of, uh, of that initiative identified a variety of connections between cultural heritage and environment. And I thought it'd be interesting to just mention the key ones that were identified as a part of that work program. Not surprisingly, given that what I've already said, the first area identified was knowledge, local, traditional, and indigenous knowledge, technology, te techniques, and innovations learned through practice. The initiative also identified language as a bridge between cultural, uh, and bio cultural diversity and biodiversity, modes of subsistence, uh, resource-based livelihoods, um, 
uh, land and sea sustainable management systems, social relations, sense of identity and attachment to place, social roles in resource use, sharing and management, gender considerations, legal institutions, and unique and diverse worldviews and belief systems and related rites and rituals, sacred sites, mythologies, cosmologies, spirituality, and values. So those were the aspects of cultural heritage that were focused on in terms of supporting biodiversity and environmental resilience. And I, I think it's interesting to note for our purposes that what is not very specifically highlighted is material culture, um, for example, buildings. Now, I, I for one do believe that material culture carries the values of society. And so when I see um, um, topics like um, identity um, and um, attachment to place, that makes me think of material culture, but the absence of a, of a lengthy discussion of material culture in this context tells us that our colleagues in the nature world, at least, put a very high premium on what we would call intangible heritage. Um, and so that, that dichotomy between a focus on material culture and a focus on uh, values and knowledge, I think, is an uh, important one for us to think about when we're talking about this topic. So now we begin to have a sense of how cultural heritage contributes to resilience. But does all cultural heritage contribute to resilience equally and in the same way? It's common to hear people say that cultural heritage is a driver and enabler of sustainability and resilience. And in fact, I have said this myself. But doesn't cultural heritage mean the entirety of knowledge derived from the experience of human practice, expressions, knowledge, skills, and associated objects and spaces that communities recognize as part of their cultural heritage? That's sort of our standard definition of cultural heritage. And it's incredibly broad. But surely some of those cultural practices and values are ones that have actually put us on the unsustainable path towards crisis that we're in. Culture is embedded in the production and consumption patterns of societies. And so our cultures support living in harmony with nature, except when they don't. In climate and biodiversity policy, there is a tendency to equate culture with indigenous peoples, as if those of us who are not indigenous don't have a culture. But I don't think that's why uh, the biodiversity context so closely links culture with indigenous peoples. Rather, I think it's because most indigenous culture is non-industrialized. And so you can largely assume that indigenous cultures support living in harmony with nature. The issue is with people like me. I'm from an industrial state in the United States where cul car culture and suburban sprawl is king. And so my culture is as much a part of the planetary problem as it is a part of the planetary solution. So yes, memorialize my culture, learn from it, but in terms of perpetuating it as a living culture, there's going to require some selectivity if we can say that my culture supports um, pl planetary, um, planetary um, um, addressing the planetary emergency. And so I hope I have given you a, a few things to think about as we go into the more specific presentations about the way cultural heritage supports addressing the climate crisis and the um, supports environmental resilience. I just want to leave you with a reference to one specific document. And that document is called Malama Hanua. In 2016, ECOMOS and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, supported a joint session on integrating nature and culture. And the outcome document for that uh, program was called Malama Haunua, which in Hawaiian means to care for island earth. One of, and you can find that document by Googling Malama Haunua. One of the remarkable things that, that document provided is the conclusion that the very culture nature divide that we talk about in our professional practice is actually a symptom of the larger processes that have put the earth on an unsustainable path. So in other words, the way that we have divided culture and nature in our work itself is symptomatic of the problem. And so Malama Hanua asked every heritage professional, natural and cultural heritage professional, in their own professional practice, in their own personal life, to try to be the change that they would like to see, to strive to integrate nature and culture and do things like always work in cross-functional teams, 
reach out across silos in your own work and your own practice. We know that the status quo is what has given us the climate emergency and the planetary emergency. And so in the end, if we're going to help solve that problem, we need to diverge from the status quo and support transformative change. And so with, with those opening remarks, I'm excited to hear from my colleagues, additional examples from how these concepts are being realized in communities. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrew, for that fantastic talk. And uh, right now I would like uh, to give the word to Paolo who will give some just small summary of what you have spoken. Eh, voy a darle la palabra a Paolo, quien va a dar eh, un pequeño resumen eh, de, de lo que habló Andrew. Paolo. Bueno, no es muy fácil resumir porque muchos elementos puso Andrew en discusión, pero eh, es muy importante lo que estuvo oh, explicándonos siempre de, eh, de esta emergencia planetaria que tenemos en este momento, que es eh, uno de los... Eh, elementos más, más importantes y más peligrosos también para el, el patrimonio, por lo cual es necesario vivir siempre en armonía con el planeta. Y una de las cuestiones más importantes es eso de la palabra de la resiliencia. ¿Qué quiere decir? La resiliencia es la capacidad de transformarse, la capacidad de adaptarse, la capacidad de vivir con el cambio. Entonces la resiliencia tiene que ser eh, abarcar el, la, la parte humana y la parte climática en sus aspectos de multiplicidad, de diversidad y de diversidad cultural. Y lo que es muy importante también es todo el tema de eh, tener una distribución eh, equitativa y justa, porque eh, tener una resiliencia con el, cambio, con el cambio climático tiene que ir al mismo tiempo con lo que es eh, la defensa del patrimonio. Tenemos que hacer un esfuerzo todos para quedar en los objetivos de mitigar el calentamiento climático es eh, algo muy importante y esto es una cosa en la cual el patrimonio intangible, el patrimonio cultural y especialmente el patrimonio cultural del conocimiento tradicional autóctono es uno de los elementos fundamentales porque nos han enseñado que estas culturas autóctonas son las que mejor viven combinando lo que es eh, la propia capacidad de adaptarse al clima con sus propias costumbres y, y su propio clima. Pero uh, lo, lo que remarcó también, muy importante, yo creo, es una cosa muy importante lo que dijo ahora uh, Andrew, que todos, también nosotros que vivimos en otras culturas, en culturas industrializadas, que en parte somos también los responsables de lo que han sido los daños hechos hasta ahora, tenemos todo que participar en cada actividad profesional, como uh, él remarcó un documento de 2016, la declaración de Malama Honua que pide a todo profesional que trabajamos en este sector de activarse en su vida cotidiana, en su vida profesional, para juntar todos los elementos de lo que puede hacer eh, nuestra cultura, de lo que puede hacer nuestra adaptación al cambio y todo lo que puede hacer, lo que podemos hacer para una convivencia mejor entre cultura y eh, clima. Y todo esto en defensa también de nuestro patrimonio él eh, nombró no solamente el patrimonio inmaterial, pero también hay una sutil diferencia con el patrimonio material. Entonces, eh, seguramente eh, es una acción combinada que está eh, en cargo a cada uno de nosotros para la ventaja general de todos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Paolo. Fantástico. Pero haber reducido que no tenía escrito antes toda la intervención de Andrew y como habla muy rápido. Pues, Pero está bien. perfecto, perfecto. Muchas gracias. Estoy segura que eh, para, para los que hablan español fue una excelente, eh, un excelente resumen. Pero me imagino. Uh, gracias, Paolo. Me imagino so now, que los documentos estarán también después disponibles escritos por lo cual cada uno lo puede leer mejor de lo que ahí he tratado de resumir muy poco. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Uh, so, um, now I would like to give the floor to Christopher Underwood. The floor is, uh, is yours. Uh, viene ahora uh, Christopher Underwood uh, con su presentación. Muchas gracias y bienvenido. Good day to everybody and um, buen día de Argentina. 
Andrew, I'd like to thank uh, the SDG Working Group for my invitation and also to Andrew for that uh, fantastic overview of the problems we face. I'm going to really focus on uh, SDG 14, which is life below water. And I'd be absolutely honest in saying that um, when I first read all the SDGs and particularly SDG 14, which is identified with a fish below water, it wasn't absolutely obvious how underwater cultural heritage could actually contribute. But as you delve further and further into the SDGs, you begin to realize that um, UCH or underwater cultural heritage can actually be of great benefit to promoting particularly SDG through the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development 2021 uh, to 2030. So it's been a journey in a sense. And my aim today is just to exemplify some of the ways I believe um, underwater cultural heritage can actually contribute. And as I said, it's a bit of a personal journey in the sense that sitting at the first uh, planning meeting for the Decade of Ocean Science in, back in Denmark 19, uh, 2019, listening to the marine scientists talk about um, the threat to the planet, and of course that was um, made very clear by Andrew, the words, these words are my personal notes that I took throughout the two-day meeting. The ocean is too big to fail. It was pointed out that the world is expecting a 20% increase in food from the sea. And yet, at the same time, it is not sustainable at the present rate. This presented a huge, great problem. Out of sight, out of mind. That's something that we as underwater cultural heritage people often go, you can't see our heritage. It's beyond the public view. Well, this was a statement made by the marine scientists point out the very same problem that they faced insofar as not being able to get visibility in the world, particularly in light of climate action, climate change. The other big um, goals are to have open access and shared access, citizen science, but importantly, because we had people within Denmark in the organization of the meeting, we were able to implant into the opening statement in the plenary that no distinction was being made between natural and cultural heritage. That was quite a big advantage. But also, I think the Deccan has a very strong uh, legal ba uh, background. It has uh, UNCLOS, which is signed up by over 160 uh, state parties. The UNESCO Convention, um, which talks about shall cooperate and assist each other in protection and management of underwater cultural heritage. And Target 11.4, which strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural heritage. And what we mustn't forget is the SOFIA Charter, which is ICOMOS's own charter on the protection and management of UCH, um, which uh, does not suffer the, ped the impediment of having a 100-year uh, criteria. Within the decade, there are seven societal goals. A clean ocean. Well, I think Andrew mentioned industrial action in terms of making it at the moment a very unclean ocean and we can talk about microplastics and I'm going to talk about pollution from toxic cargoes in underwater cultural heritage just very briefly. Resilient ocean, I think Andrew pretty much covered that, productive in, in terms of what it can actually produce for us as a humanity and sustainably moving forward. Predicted ocean, safe ocean, I'm going to talk, uh, not talk about this particularly but this refers to things like making sure coastal communities are safe from global um, huge events such as tsunami, an accessible ocean. But what I really want to focus down on is an inspiring and engaging ocean. And actually, this was an additional societal goal, which was actually embedded during the peer review process of the implementation plan. But underpinning all of this is that in the top left of my screen, you see the science we need for the ocean we want. And we want a sustainable ocean. And I think in, at this point, it was a case of how do we, as the underwater cultural heritage community, how do I, as an individual within that community, contribute to this big goal, this huge goal, which will benefit humanity? And I'm going to start off with something that we consider a negative in terms of underwater cultural heritage, environmental concerns. And it's inevitable, I think, when we're talking about SDGs, that we have to link it very closely, not just to climate action, but also to many of the other SDGs that we take as, as read that they will be in our action moving forward. You can see from this slide, a very powerful slide, talking about 2.5 to 20 million tons of oil or even toxic cargoes remaining in, sh in 
ships on the seabed. It's clear that natural and cultural heritage is under threat from this. And we know that there are many thousands of these wrecks. But I believe we as a community can help identify the most sites under threat. Because ocean acid acidification is not just that. Sites in shallow water will be, um, there'll be an accelerated corrosion, particularly when you add uh, sea level uh, warmth or the, the increase in temperature and also the expected increase impact of tidal surges and stronger storms. And of course we see that on land, but it's also manifested at sea as well. And I mentioned ghost fishing nets because these are a pollutant too. They shroud much of which is cultural heritage. Cultural heritage sites are micro ecosystems within a big uh, oceanic ecosystem. And I think we have a, a route to helping clear these sites, but also going back to my principal slide is making sure that we protect and enhance a new um, underwater cultural heritage moving forward in a sustainable way. And just a little detail here, the, one of the big programs within the decade is Seabed 2030, which basically you can see from the objectives, I've identified those that are of relevance to underwater cultural heritage. And Andrew mentioned transformative knowledge, capacity, and capacity globally. One of the um, aims is to map the oceanic floor. And at the moment, while that knowledge is growing, it still remains a very small number. I can't remember exactly, but if I said less than 25% of the ocean floor is mapped, I probably would be fairly cl uh, close on that. On the slide on the right-hand side, this is um, a remote sensing image, and you can see that it's taken over eight years. And it shows um, change to the seabed. The little red part there is the upstanding part of a Dutch merchant ship from the 17th century, an important cultural heritage site. But the information that we're gathering in the management of und underwater cultural heritage is of particular benefit and additional benefit to those to marine scientists who are interested in climatic change on the seabed. And here you can see from 2000, um, sorry, 2009 back to 2002, significant changes represented by the colors. The bottom one you can see is actually quite well covered and shallow. But as we come forward to 2009, the blue indicates that there is scour or action, which is removing part of the seabed. That is part of the problem regarding the increased climatic changes caused by sea level rise, sea level stronger forces, enhanced currents. This is all causing a removal in some parts of the seabed and in other parts, an aggregation, a growth, or a, let's say islands forming, you might say. So there is change on the seabed, which of course we can't see, but uh, underwater, underwater cultural heritage managers are managing these on a um, sort of annual basis. So we can contribute with very detailed knowledge about not just the micro ecosystem, which is the shipwreck, which will also change as these seabed changes actually takes place, but also the seabed itself and predict what might happen, not just in one year, two year, three year, 10 years, but decades moving forward. And that needs to be managed and made sustainable. A little detail, and I think this is where marine, natural marine sciences and archeological sciences come together, that as part of that management of, let's say the micro ecosystem that is an underwater cultural heritage site, we're using data loggers which can measure uh, the redox potential, the oxygen rich or not, changes in pH, bioturbidity, which is basically particular matter carried in, in water, chemical solution, uh, pollution and sulfur content. All of these are vital in terms of monitoring our oceanic ecosystem, not just from an underwater cultural heritage perspective, but joining forces. And, and I think Andrew mentioned transformative uh, partnerships. Underwater cultural heritage has been an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary activity of science for many years, and that continues to evolve. Where I think underwater cultural heritage community can really contribute to um, the decade is through ocean literacy programs. And the little map there shows 
different organizations, some of which are already related to UNESCO, uh, the Maritime Museums, joining forces to promote knowledge about the sea. Because I think it's fair to say that with climate action, which tends to subsume everything else, people are looking inwards, not outwards. In other words, outwards being the sea. And I think ocean literacy, the key to it, is actually persuading, encouraging, and through that societal goal number seven, getting people to engage, understand, and realize that the ocean is under threat, but also needs to be made sustainable, but also accessible and enjoyable by, by people. Those are our big goals. And you can see on the left, another quotation from the, the planning meeting, without the support of the public, the decade will not be successful. And this in any political change, and you can apply this to terrestrial climate action, without the political support, you, we are going to be perhaps less successful. We hope not unsuccessful, but less successful. So that remains a key goal. And there is a framework within which we can all work, uh, created by the um, IOC, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, a created a framework of action. And there are four levels. And the program of uh, the decade program is basically a, a global reach, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and will be a multi-event. And that will spread through the 10 years of the decade moving forward from 2021 through to 2030. And of course, we expect that come tw halfway through the decade, this coming decade, we will also have SDG goals for 2030, 2040. So we've got to look further ahead and predict how we can contribute to uh, the future model for the oceans. A de decade project is typically would contribute to a program, so it would be an individual perhaps project, national project contributing to an international project, or a, a local project contributing to national and therefore to the international. Decade activity could be a meeting to promote, and ICOMOS ICUT will be doing a series of meetings and also probably include in our webinar chain um, specific um, activities related to the decade. And a decade contribution is, is really sponsorship or gift in kind or help to promote the decade moving forward. The ultimate goal is, of course, to integrate underwater culture heritage. And I think um, Andrew summed this up very well. And I, 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 I wrote in my notebook that we have to connect with place we identity, we identify, particularly island nations and, and including the United Kingdom, my home nation, identify with the ocean. But also other countries which are not necessarily coastal states do not necessarily connect with the ocean, but nonetheless, they must understand the threat to the ocean and contribute to its sustainable development. And also, I think a key point that was made earlier as well, intangible heritage is of vital importance. And I think this is something where the stories related to the connections made by underwater culture edge, particularly shipwrecks, they bring communities together. They have a sense of place, they have identity, and also in a media environment, they're extremely popular. So the intangibility, the intangible heritage related to many sites, underwater culture heritage sites, are of vital importance in bringing people to understand that the ocean is really important, its sustainability is essential, and its contribution to a sustainable modern world is absolutely critical. And just to summarize some of the, the key points, the ocean mapping, data standards, collection, open access. It was described during the planning meeting that data should be a public good. That means it should be open and of value to and access to everybody, not hidden, not some sort of state secret, but open to everybody. Ocean literacy, society must connect with the ocean. It is part of the SDG 13 climate action. It is fundamental to it. And the ecosystem management will be a transdisciplinary approach, which I think within our community we already embrace, but I think it needs to be the standard operational practice, connecting underwater culture heritage with marine science and to bring a better future for the ocean. I'd just like to draw attention to ODHM, which is the Ocean Decade Heritage Network, uh, within which uh, many ICOMOS members are part and part of the initial um, 
driving force during the meeting in, in uh, Scandinavia. And I would like to say thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chris, for this amazing presentation and opening us the eyes to another world. Eh, gracias, Chris, por esta presentación tan increíble y por abrirnos los ojos a este otro mundo. Eh, ahora le voy a dar la palabra a Paolo, quien hará las, uh, un resumen de lo que eh, presentó Chris. Now we'll give the word to Paolo, who will give a um, short summary of what uh, Chris presented. Paolo, gracias. Bueno, creo que esta presentación verdaderamente nos abrió los ojos a un mundo que lo tenemos cerca, pero no lo conocemos muy poco. Y bueno, estaban las traducciones hechas por ONU en todas las slides, que eran muy claras. Me parece de remarcar que era muy importante lo que dijo Christopher. Bueno, que el océano, la parte que todos sabemos que representa la gran parte del, del globo, es un elemento fundamental para uh, lo, todo lo que es uh, el, la sobrevivencia del planeta, no solo para el cambio climático, pero también por todo lo que se refiere a, a, al, al human mankind, digamos, a, 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 a la sociedad humana. Se prevé que del océano pueda venir hasta el 20% de nuestras necesidades alimentarias, pero oh, no lo conocemos bastante bien. No hay datos suficientes y no hay una participación ciudadana en todo esto. El, el océano, uh, ha habido muchos documentos, eh, se han sido publicando en las últimas décadas, el océano tiene que ser limpio, resiliente, productivo, predictivo, y es un elemento de conexión entre todas las poblaciones que viven alrededor de él. El océano es un elemento de conexión entre todos, uh, y tiene un valor muy importante también como un resultado societal, o social común para todos. Y primeramente es, entonces, resultado social, quiere decir tener un océano limpio. Los objetivos importantes para alcanzar uh, todo esto es aumentar la capacidad de conocimiento, que no tenemos casi ninguno del océano como es, incrementar el mapeo del fondo marino. Al día de hoy, solamente el 25% de lo que nos contó Christopher está mapeado de manera correcta. Hay que prever los cambios climáticos en las próximas décadas, por uh, lo que está pasando en los océanos, porque el, el cambio climático, y el océano es uno de los factores más importantes del cambio climático, por lo cual hay que poderlos ir a prever. Y hay que continuar también a cartografiar, no solamente eh, el mapeo, pero cartografiar todo lo que se encuentra adentro del océano. El fondo marino se mueve constantemente, con cambios muy grandes, que se refieren a a la sedimentación en el fondo que va cambiando, que no sabíamos que se cambiaba, al, a las características de las aguas, su sanibilidad que va cambiando también, a los objetos que hay en el fondo marino que crean unos intercambios sin profundos en su entorno. Entonces, en todo esto hay que promover un conocimiento oceánico entre toda la población mundial, a través de la ciencia, de acciones también de conocimiento más prácticas como el buceo, como museos marinos, datos, y sin un apoyo global no hay seguramente un éxito para alcanzar estos objetivos. Hay un programa fundamental que es el programa de la década, que es un programa uh, bueno, empujado por una, Naciones Unidas, es un programa uh, interdisciplinario que promueve todas las actividades que están conectadas al, uh, al conocimiento del fondo marino. Se basa en los elementos que antes estuvo ya mencionando en las slides anteriores, es la, una cartografía, una educación ciudadana general sobre el océano, un apoyo científico y una gestión del ecosistema oceánico, que es el más importante que tenemos en el planeta y que nos involucra a todos y cuyo efecto, los cambios son fundamentales para el cambio climático. Espero de haber resumido un poco lo que él dijo, pero en, en las slides estaba muy, muy claro esta cosa. Y yo creo que también a nosotros que estamos todos trabajando en el patrimonio, no hasta ahora hemos eh, tomado mucha conciencia, mucho conocimiento de lo que pasa en el fondo marino. Por lo cual, la acción que se está desarrollando a través eh, de, de, del grupo que estudia el fondo marino y para el objetivo 14, creo que tiene que tener mucha más relevancia de lo que nosotros le estuvimos dando hasta ahora. Muchísimas gracias.
Gracias, Paolo. Thank you um, for the uh, summary again. Really well done, and I think it's uh, really good for the uh, to to have this wrap up. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Nupur uh, Nupur Prothi. Quisiera darle la palabra a Nupur Prothi. Por favor, el la palabra es tuya. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Una, and thank you, uh, Chris and um, Andrew, for fantastic presentations for this. I'm going to try to uh, talk about the SDGs, but looking at how each one of us, through whatever work we are doing, at whatever scale, are contributing to the uh, agenda. So here's what uh, I've been working with for a long time, and I call it a landscape approach, uh, very similar to many journeys, the culture nature journey, the connecting practice project, and uh, all of the lot of work we're doing internationally, but taking it down to the scale of the community, people, and you know, the our towns and cities. So um, we're looking at local, uh, you know, local action. From local action, looking at people action, because a lot of times we're talking about SDGs, we are looking at the global agenda. We're looking at uh, you know what can be done uh, to address climate change and climate action. But here I'm going to be looking at predominantly what we can do at our individual levels. And I think what I also want to mention here is that we have to understand there are regions which are especially vulnerable, while we might be vulnerable as a community but also understanding how communities themselves can safeguard their future in the face of this climate reality. So let's come down to this local narrative of one dot on our globe in one small place. Here is a, a town in a very arid, in a very dry place in India. And what you may be able to see is this small tank right in the center in pink stone uh, just below this hillock, uh, one of, uh, you know, a traditional tank where water was collected. So what we see when we approach this tank is this, this is what we see. And, and what Chris said that, you know, uh, actually being able to also highlight what you can't see. So in this tank, you're seeing the water collected, you're seeing the steps, you're seeing, you know, a space that is for the community, but you're also seeing the pollution that it is going through right now. You're also looking at the fact that it's not really kept very well at the moment. And this is what you don't see. So when we as uh, the cultural landscape people go to site, uh, we also become detectives of some sort. Uh, we go behind uh, this uh, space and we start looking at, okay, you know, this is the hillock. There is an obvious logic to where this tank is located. And behind the tank, there's an obvious logic to how the water is collected from the hillock going through various processes of natural cleaning and collection of debris before this water enters the tank. So you see these channel systems and uh, you start exploring the working of the water system in that landscape uh, before you actually come to the tank. And then when you explore a little bit further, you also see that uh, the, the whole neighborhood around this tank is called, uh, you know, it's acknowledging the landscape because here the street is called a neighborhood of the tank, of the water tank. So the moment you have people naming their street after the water tank, you would imagine that it is there on their conscience, it's there in their, uh, you know, in front of them that the tank is important. But actually the reality when you see the tank itself, you find that somewhere there is a disconnect. Somewhere though in the address the name plate right outside their door, the tank is mentioned. Uh, they have been born and brought up in these landscapes. However, the water itself and the whole traditional knowledge system itself has disappeared somewhere. So as this cultural landscape detective, when we move further in the neighborhood, we start seeing these water structures, different kinds of water structures. On the left, uh, on the top is this pink structure, which literally was embedded in a very dense locality and it was, uh, you know, a step well where people would collect water, their drinking water from. But 
what happened was that when you look at it today, it's literally just a dumping ground. Uh, I haven't uh, shown the picture here of how the plastic is being collected at the bottom, uh, you know, just a, a waste. You see a lot of wells which are uh, all over the landscape, but none of them are well maintained. None of them are actually you being used to uh, collect water today. And you start seeing that how when the person has the water on their nameplate right, right outside the door, they're not able to recognize these water structures and their relevance in a very dry environment. And so I put up, put up this map here and this map shows actually how various festivals and festival procession routes would go around a lot of water structures, a lot of, um, you know, uh, religious structures. And also in this neighborhood, they were laying down a lot of water infrastructure, pipelines, and so on and so forth, not realizing that what would happen when these pipes, which are being laid out in 2020, would run dry in a few years. How could they reconnect with their local traditional systems because obviously uh, you see uh, we all know that that traditional knowledge of the structures that you see are hinting towards what you don't see which is the underground aquifers the the presence of water where you don't see it so how can we start uh, actually bringing the community back to what they see in their immediate neighborhoods because we are not able to do that or that is not happening, I zoom out into our metropolitan cities. So this is coming out from a small town in an arid area in India to a you know, large metropolitan uh, city of Chennai, which in 2015 faced uh, you know, a huge flood, went through a very uh, distressing climate event. Down to 2019, another distressing situation of a drought down to 2020 where hyderabad one of uh, you know a leading uh, it city of india again going through a huge climate event now we know that you know every city in india is going through it we know that every monsoon everyone you know which they used to celebrate uh, monsoons it's it's celebrated in our poetry in so many of our books and songs today is uh, people are so worried because they don't know that they'll have a home after that monsoon or not. So here is where, uh, you know, we start looking at our cultural heritage and our traditional systems, where our traditional systems in Chennai looked at the temple tanks, looked at our flood control, looked at preventing soil erosion, groundwater recharge. You know, we have all of this inbuilt into our systems, yet we are in the midst of this climate crisis. Then we come to the SDGs, we're talking about clean water, we're talking about, uh, you know, target, um, all, all the uh, targets on sustainable cities, we're talking about climate action, life on land, Chris is talking about underwater. If we look at each of these, you know, within them, there are so many targets that, you know, we when we start looking at this landscape approach, how do we, in our capacity of working on ground, on smaller projects, how can we restore, using the landscape approach, this connection back to our water, this connection back for the local community to start looking, not relying on municipality, not relying on a policy, not relying on administration, but seeing how their awareness towards their immediate neighborhoods is going to make the difference. How, when we look at, uh, you know, safeguarding cultural and natural heritage we're talking about it in various uh, culture nature projects we're talking about it between icomos and iucn on connecting practice projects but on ground we realize there is no distinction in traditional cultures between culture and nature so how then do we start looking at uh, having the communities revisit their heritage both cultural and natural heritage how do we start looking at a uh, climate action through their lens. You know, uh, I find that uh, SDGs and the different goals are just different perspectives and everything that uh, Andrew has addressed and Chris has addressed, what has been addressed during this climate action week uh, and what is going to be addressed in the next 10 years of uh, the decade of action of the SDG. 
we are all talking about the same things. We're just using different languages. We're using different boxes of the SDG goals. But how do we actually collaborate? How do we collaborate actively so that every action we take on ground, a small footprint, takes us on this pilgrimage towards the longer goal of being able to address a reality which is on our doorstep already. I think resilience is a very important aspect that uh, Andrew brings in, Chris brings in, a lot of conversations that we are having on climate action bring in, and resilience at the level of the community. Resilience with the community actually building themselves up. The same thing of the community not depending on uh, you know, the, the municipal uh, water supply, but looking at their traditional structures. So when we look at this, you know, we are looking at a landscape approach is really about a change in perspective. Thank you, Ona, for reminding us that today is the World Children's Day, because it's very important to understand that this conversation is about preparing our children, our youth, because it's a, you know, we're looking at 2030, which is round the corner, many youth and children who are maybe 10 to 15 years old are going to be the actual recipients of whatever we do today. They're going to be the leaders of bringing about this change. So let's all of us see ourselves as a part of a larger landscape, whatever action we do, whether it's the ocean landscape, the water landscape, you know, the, the, the landscape on land, let us all see ourselves as part of this landscape let us acknowledge and work with our local landscapes as our contribution to global climate action. Thank you very much to uh, Gabe for and Gabe and team for inviting me here. And thank you, Paolo, for the, inter the translation that you're going to be doing soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nupur. Uh, again, really, really inspiring presentation, especially seeing it um, through the eyes of the yeah, example in India. And um, I would like to give now the, the word to Paolo eh, exactly to help with the, the translation. Eh, quisiera darle las gracias a Nupur por su presentación eh, llena de inspiración y también con el ejemplo eh, en India. Y ahora quisiera darle la palabra a Paolo, quien va a hacer un, un resumen de la presentación de Nupur en español. Paolo, la palabra es tuya. Muchísimas gracias. Bueno, la presentación de Nupur que empieza haciendo un ejemplo desde la India, pero podría ser un ejemplo en cualquier otro lugar del mundo con algún otro tipo de acercamiento, es importante para llegar a las conclusiones finales a las cuales ella llega. Ella tomó como ejemplo todo el sistema de aguas que llevan a tanques, a depósitos de agua en la India en zonas muy secas, de clima muy seco, en el cual atrás de ver ese, ese depósito de agua, que creo que yo también personalmente he conocido, atrás en el paisaje hay todo un sistema enorme, que no se ve, es un sistema de canales, de regadíos, de pozos, en el cual las comunidades actuales, las comunidades locales actuales, han perdido un poco el conocimiento. Entonces, eh, esta falta del conocimiento, de esta falta de... Eh, eh, regulación de todo el sistema de aguas, por ejemplo, que antes se veía claramente en el paisaje, se puede ver en los cambios que ella nos mostró que nos están pasando en las últimas décadas. Tenemos cambios enormes con inundaciones cada pocos años, momentos de sequía muy fuertes, etc. Entonces, eh, la cuestión fundamental es cómo se puede hacer eh, para volver a respetar Landscape, que no es exactamente el paisaje de la palabra, pero es el entorno, digamos, eh, ambiental, para que eh, estas cosas eh, puedan tener un valor eh, importante para lo que era el conocimiento del patrimonio. Bueno, seguramente la idea que ha dicho es esa de trabajar en mini proyectos locales para hacer proyectos todos relacionados al ecosistema local, eh, siguiendo, por ejemplo, los varios objetivos que hay entre los objetivos de la Agenda 2000, el, 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 el objetivo 3, el objetivo 14, o sea, porque uno se refiere en particular a las islas más pequeñas, a donde tienen otros tipos de problemas, pero siempre con un acercamiento muy fuerte en el cual se está poniendo junto el patrimonio cultural y material 
de la gente que vive ahí con el patrimonio físico que está representado con una visión integral, la llamaría casi holística, del paisaje como elemento que eh, incluye a todos. Me parece que es muy importante su frase final, que todos hacemos parte de un paisaje más grande, que es nuestro planeta y que todos tenemos que trabajar juntos para mantener este paisaje, para conservarlo, volviendo también atrás, estudiando todo lo que han sido las intervenciones anteriores que sean parte de nuestra cultura, de cada comunidad local. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Paolo. Perfecto. Eh, estamos muy bien de tiempo. Uh, thank you, Paolo. We are really good um, with our timing. And uh, now I'd like to start the Q&A. We will open for the Q&A. Uh, vamos a empezar las preguntas y respuestas. If you have questions, please use the chat box or, you know, if you want to, to talk as well, we'll be happy to hear you. We're in a, a small group and uh, you can also show your videos. Um, si quieren, tienen preguntas, por favor, las ponen en, en el chat. Y también si quieren hablar o quieren eh, con, el, con el video, eh, están bienvenidos. Eh, I will give the floor now to Roberta, who will be um, helping us moderating the... Q&A, le voy a dar el, el, eh, el, la oportunidad ahora de, para que Roberta eh, sea la moderadora de las preguntas y respuestas. Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ona. Um, so, we have a couple of questions. We have one um, for Andrew, which is, um, do you think that the, the lack of traditional knowledge has made people less aware of climate knowledge. How do you think non-heritage people and policymakers can link back to these elder concepts and advocate the promotion of traditional knowledge? Uh, what do you think, Andrew? Uh, well, th thank you for the question. And it's an important one. Um, it, it's interesting to note that the Convention on Biodiversity has actually adopted um, indicators to measure the uh, progress towards achieving the ideas embedded in the section 8.9 of the Convention on Biodiversity that I mentioned, the one that links uh, knowledge and uh, local knowledge and, and life ways and um, livelihoods to um, safeguarding biodiversity. And they have four indicators. And in general, I actually think it would be very interesting if the cultural heritage uh, sector um, took on board those indicators and tried to measure for ourselves our progress in that regard. But I bring it up because one of the four indicators says that um, the success of realizing the potential of traditional knowledge can be measured by the degree to which uh, traditional knowledge is incorporated into policy and legal frameworks. And so um, I think that sets out a pretty good goal. Uh, how, to what extent, is traditional knowledge informing decision-making by government at all levels and informing policy. And we have a similar goal in the Clim Climate Heritage Network, but one of our objectives is to um, make sure that cultural heritage is incorporated into climate planning, for example, in adaptation frameworks and climate action plans at all levels. And so I think if you begin to ask the very practical question, When I look at the plans and policies of my local government, of my region, of my country, to what extent is traditional knowledge incorporated, then we start to see a pathway to making progress on the question that you asked about. Thank you, Andrew. So um, we have another question from Ege. Uh, to Chris, uh, how can we link the seascapes and landscapes and the underwater and, co and coastal ecosystems in terms of cultural heritage and the SDGs? Uh, in my opinion, uh, yes, you can hear me. Um, in my opinion, uh, as I said in the chat to a, a few people, there should be seamless ma uh, management of cultural heritage. The, the line that we draw on maps is totally artificial. It moves, every day it moves. And over time, it moves even further. And if a proper management plan in any individual country should include a reciprocity between factors that involve 
terrestrial heritage and underwater cultural heritage and not draw the, and there is one, I suppose I should have a proviso there, that marine law, to some extent, can be in conflict with terrestrial law, but it's not something that can be not overcome. It can be policy rather than law. And I think as, um, that's, the, I, that's what I think is the way forward, is stop looking at this artificial barrier. When you stand on the coastline, you look out to sea, it should be within the policy makers the opportunity to include what's actually laying on the seabed, whether that be biology, biological heritage, or cultural heritage. Do the other speakers have any ideas on what we can contribute? Um, sorry to interrupt one second. I don't know if Paolo, you want to say some words about the, the answers? Uh, dar alguna opinión acerca de las respuestas en español o continuamos? Bueno, continúa porque yo las eh, tengo que mirar un poco las la chats un momentito, ¿ok? Sí. Porque no, no, no las he leído todavía. todavía. Yeah, so uh, Paolo will make just a really short summary uh, at the end of the Q&A. Unless we have a question in Spanish, we will translate it. Um, bear with us. Eh, Paolo va a hacer una traducción, eh, un poco un resumen de lo que se habló al final de las eh, preguntas y respuestas. Es difícil eh, traducir eh, absolutamente todo. Gracias. So we also have a general question um, to all three speakers about who is focusing on the inclusive dynamic realities and the potential of culture rather than cultural heritage. Um, I don't know. Andrew, would you like to start? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I'm not sure I have a, a good answer to the question which I saw in the chat. I, I, I spend a lot of time as a, in the policy realm working to unify actors um, from arts, culture, and heritage. So for example, the Climate Heritage Network, we've been seek, seeking sectoral representation with the UN in climate policy. And heritage alone, we're not a big enough field to obtain that. But if we combine with arts and culture, then, then perhaps. So in that regard, um, as I said, I spent a lot of time with people who identify themselves as being from culture or arts or performing arts as distinguished from heritage. And the categories are so porous and so um, overlapping that, um, I find it quite difficult to to draw these distinctions. And I, I clearly, the distinctions are there to be drawn. If you put banners up labeled culture, art, heritage, different people will stand underneath different ones. So they're obviously perceiving core realities under those labels that are distinct. But uh, I find that the overlap is as, as, as great as the differentiation. And so I, I don't think I have a grand insight into the distinctions between them. Okay, Roberto, I'd like to add something here if I may. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's an interesting question that Dennis has posed, but I find that uh, we have over the last few decades been so focused on expertise, uh, you know, and, and separations of, of uh, what, where, what perspective we are coming from and you know, what kind of expertise we bring with us. And the change that the reason uh, we say a change in perspective and why we're calling it a landscape approach or an overall approach, you're looking at an SDG as a, you know, a whole approach, not just the individual squares, is because like Andrew said, it's very difficult to really put boundaries and silos in definitions or perspectives. Now, I think a very important word here is dynamic. So first, let's, let's understand that if you're going to be making a change, we have to also understand across what's happening. We have to, you know, get out of our uh, particular expertise. Chris says there are no real boundaries between where is land and where is water. Someone very beautifully once defined a river as being a collection of raindrops. It's not the way we draw two lines on a landscape, right? It changes. It, 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 uh, it, it changes in every season. It's dry sometimes. There is no water. But anyways... I think the important bit is also about the dynamic bit. And in when we say dynamic cultural heritage or dynamic, it means that it's changing. 
we all know that it's changing the the understanding is changing now today is the day in india which is a particular prayer that happens on the waterfront six days after diwali it's called the chhat puja a huge affair but what has happened is it had a certain link to nature but today that link to nature the importance of keeping the river clean and praying to a natural ecosystem has got disconnected where that praying is happening to any water body which could be a static water feature in the center of the city even so when we look at dynamic heritage we look at dynamic you know we we have to now understand how are we when we talk about ocean literacy we talk about environmental literacy we talk about landscape literacy i think we need to somewhere move back and think where is this disconnect happening because many traditional communities have it in built in their systems but there is an obvious disconnect where it's not getting translated on ground that under so you know we have to stand dynamic we have to understand that there is a cultural perspective now whether it is what we've inherited as cultural heritage whether it's what we are adding today uh, but keeping in mind that there is a future which is already on our doorstep and how the best can be taken out from this traditional wisdom to address that uh, future so just some thoughts on that thank you nupur um dennis rodwell would you like to comment any further i'm seeing some comments on the chat box uh you're muted yeah i'm trying to unmute sorry um i just added a comment because it's what i expected uh, we're dealing here with academic silos and this is the problem um and i'm talking about um not talking about limited definitions of culture that relate to arts and the theater and um all of this stuff i'm talking about what is embedded in any society which determines how they behave how they behave together as individuals with each other and how they um relate to their envi environment this is not about arts theater and cultural heritage this is the basic raw um generic um understanding of the word culture and this is lost and because we are not uh taking we're not able and academia is is not helping here because it has the silos that uh, nupur was was um talking about and it's a, a condition of modern um society the people are specialized in one field and not in another um and this is uh where i'm seeing the big gap um and when you talk about uh, the impact of cultural heritage on climate change in for example the built environment and then focus on what is listed as built environment which might be 2% of the building um environment that we see around us um then we're simply not uh, connecting with the 100% which we need to um this is where i'm finding the the basic problem um that uh, we we're, we're not actually i i was been involved with the united nations system for quite a long time um and in the early 2000s there was a, a notion to incorporate culture as one of the four pillars of sustainable development and to incorporate that into the revision of the millennium development goals because nobody got to grips with the notion an inclusive covering relating definition of culture it got narrowed down into cultural heritage and i think we've we've lost the plot and um we're not able to make any meaningful impact um on the uh, climate change debate and this is what uh, concerns me well i mean De dennis on uh, at a very granular individual local vernacular level I guess I still don't perceive a a difference in the dynamicism of heritage versus culture but I do completely agree with you that there is an issue in terms of sort of the the state sanctioned definition of culture the quote unquote officially listed inventoried uh idea of cultural heritage and in fact um I I only was able to mention this briefly in my remarks but one of the major assignments given to cultural heritage in terms of environmental resilience is in promoting people-centered approaches equity um justice and 
Um, that's difficult to do when you have formal mechanisms of cultural heritage practice that are not inclusive, are not transparent, when the governance of, of cultural heritage is exclusive and not inclusive. And so who gets to say what the cultural heritage of a community is? If it's limited to a government issued list and that list is exclusive, then culture is not, cultural heritage is not gonna be able to play the role of inclusion and cohesion. And so I completely agree with you about the disconnect between the formal processes of government sanctioned heritage inventorying and the idea of inclusive uh, cultural heritage. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. So I would like to continue with, um, a, actually was a comment, but I would like to turn it into a question from Cathy um, in Facebook. Um, in Spanish it says, ciertamente hay que socializar el conocimiento y promover la participación y empoderamiento comunitario. Aún así, y en la estela de los efectos negativos en las economías locales causados por la pandemia de la COVID-19, la seguridad de los vestigios culturales sumergidos es una preocupación ante la falta de recursos para proveer seguridad a las comunidades y sitios y preocupa también la amenaza del tráfico ilícito ante el riesgo que está que este sea percibido como una forma de ingreso. Um, in Spanish, uh, it would be something like, certainly it is necessary to socialize knowledge and promote community participation and empowerment. Even so, and in the wake of the negative effects of the local economies caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the safety of un um, underwater cultural heritage remains is a concern given, given the lack of resources to provide security to communities and sites. And it concerns also the threat of illicit trafficking given the risk that is perceived as a form of income. And I would like to pose this question to Chris. Um, so what are the issues of underwater heritage and illicit, illicit trafficking while in COVID? Um, we always have a problem with this issue in whatever economic environment we face. But I think it's fair to say that in any economic environment which becomes more difficult, people look to illicit trafficking and commercial exploitation of underwater cultural heritage. So the problem will just get worse. And I think part of the problem we face in the sense is lack of oversight. Some countries have started employing satellite-based monitoring of known sites, but there are thousands and thousands of, of underwater cultural heritage sites which have no oversight. And I, and I think that remains a big problem. And I think worse is that it's clear reading some of the uh, mitigation strategies, the adaptation strategies of some governments that I've read statements to the effect that while we in the past considered underwater cultural heritage important because of the current situation, which I guess will have been in, uh, enhanced by COVID, it is not, we can't consider it as important as it was. Well, I think some of us in our community would say, we're not sure it's ever been really very important. And it's shocking to think that it's even less important now. And again, that, that remains a challenge for us to maintain um, underwater cultural heritage on the political and economic landscape. Uh, it, it is there um, in terms of potential for well-being through tourism and in, in parallel with all the cultural heritage sites in the terrestrial world. Um, so yes, we, we feel perhaps we, we've got an heightened risk rather than a lowered risk. Thank you, Chris. And I would like to thank uh, Roberta for uh, managing the Q&A. Uh, gracias a, a Chris por esa respuesta. El, el, el se enfoca también mucho en la parte de la falta de eh, monitoreo, porque si, si, no, si no hay como una identificación de los sitios, eh, también es difícil eh, protegerlos. Pero le quiero dar también la palabra a Paolo si quiere dar algunas eh, eh, conclusiones un poco acerca de esta sesión. Yo tengo un, 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 un comentario. Primero, me ha impactado mucho lo que estaba hablando antes de Christopher sobre el tema de las autoridades locales, de sensibilizarlas, porque para, para ellos efectivamente el mundo se termina a, a la orilla del mar. Y entonces, mientras hay muchísima atención y planificación y estudio 
para todo lo que se refiere a la tierra, no hay lo mismo para lo que se refiere en la parte marina. Entonces hay que pensar a una, a, a sensibilizar a las autoridades para que eh, tengan un enfoque mucho más amplio. Well, I, what I want to say, I was impressed before about what saying Christopher about the um, attitude of public authorities who often they think of planning only on what it is ground or land. They're not taking in consideration what is happening just in front of the shore, what is the underground. So the idea of uh, make them aware, to make them sensitive about the need of studying with the same importance, the relevance, also what is happening after the coastline. So to, and to have a, an approach that is considering both inland and both the ocean in front of their countries or whatever it is. That was the first consideration. The other consideration was, um, after I'm translating in Spanish, about was saying Dennis, about a gap. Uh, the gap uh, is very big. I am now belonging to these uh, academic uh, seminars in the last years, but I have been uh, operating all the rest of my life on the practical ground. And I find that still now it is a gap between whatever it is our uh, academic discussions and what is happening outside. So the need of really a cross um, communication across experience, across everything is fundamental. Fundamental that we succeed. Eh, perdón, Paolo, nos das una, una traducción en español, por sí, favor. Sí. sí, estaba diciendo que la segunda sí. cosa que me impactó muchísimo es lo que estaba diciendo Dennis about el problema que hay un gap muy fuerte entre eh, lo que es eh, realmente la misma academia y lo que es eh, la realidad, por lo cual hay una, necesi una necesidad muy fuerte de eh, tener un, un cruce de informaciones, un cruce cultural, un cruce entre todos los que, los que están participando a esta actividad, porque si no, este riesgo que eh, el gap entre lo que estamos hablando nosotros y lo que hablan lo, lo, los gobiernos y la realidad son completamente fuertes y diferentes. Es, una, es un tema que eh, entre lo que se llama patrimonio cultural y cultura. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, ahora voy a darle la palabra a Mauro. Eh, Mauro, para que presentes eh, el video, por favor. Eh, now the floor goes to Mauro, please. Perfecto, Ona. Muchas gracias. Greetings from Argentina, from the South of America. Un saludo especial para los participantes de habla hispana y también para los participantes de lengua portuguesa. For us, it's a great honor to be participating in this webinar. We especially thank for the, to the organizers for inviting us. We are convinced that the arts, culture and heritage have the potential to bring communities together around the common goal of climate action. Estamos convencidos que la gran diversidad cultural de nuestras comunidades es la clave para poder implementar medidas de adaptación y mitigación frente al cambio climático. Por ese motivo, realizamos el documental Adaptación y Mitigación basadas en el patrimonio, que se estrenará mañana, sábado 21 de noviembre. Los invitamos a seguirnos en las redes sociales y a ver el estreno en YouTube. Nos encuentran con el hashtag Patrimonio Adaptación Mitigación. Convidamos a vocês a nos seguir nas redes sociais e ver a estreia amanhã no YouTube. Podem acessar o conteúdo através do hashtag Patrimonio Adaptação Mitigação. We invite you to follow us on social networks and to see the premiere tomorrow on YouTube. Find us with the hashtag Heritage Adaptation Mitigation. Muchas gracias por sua atenção. Muito obrigado pela atenção. Thank you very much for your attention. Gracias, Mauro. Ahora voy a poner el trailer. Um, please let me know if it's working the sound. Are you seeing what you should be seeing? Estamos viendo la presentación del de organizador. Is it right? Mauro, estamos bien? 
No, eh, tendrías que cambiar la vista. No sé qué pasó acá. Déjame ver. Estás trabajando con varias pantallas al mismo tiempo. Sí, Quizás. esto es una locura. Vamos No hay problema. otra vez. Voy a poner esta, la pantalla completa. Vamos a ver. Perfecto, ahí ahora sí. Vamos a ver y el sonido. Va. Si pudiera subir un poquito el volumen sería genial. Perfecto, muchas gracias. climático tiene como objetivo unir a diversos actores del espectro de las artes. Arte, la cultura y el patrimonio como parte del movimiento de acción climática. El INISAP, Instituto de Investigación en Arquitectura y Territorio, Hábitat, Patrimonio, Tecnología, surge como una oportunidad para propiciar y contribuir con la recuperación y afirmación de nuestra identidad a partir de la revalorización de nuestros bienes patrimoniales. Eh, consciente de los impactos generados por el cambio climático sobre las comunidades y sobre su patrimonio, desde ICOMUS Argentina hemos desarrollado actividades para compartir diversas experiencias relacionadas a la protección, la conservación, la restauración y la sostenibilidad del patrimonio cultural. Climate action can no longer afford, particularly in these times of a global pandemic, to be single issue solutions. Rather, we need to combine our resources, our talents, our traditional cultural knowledge, our modern technology, and bring non-traditional partners into the conversation for greater climate ambition. Necesitamos encontrar y consensuar los fundamentos de una ética ecológica planetaria que nos guíen en nuestras respuestas y aplicar una mirada ecológica integral con sus componentes ambientales, económicos, sociales y culturales al transitar las naturaleza. De este modo tendremos mejores chances de acercarnos al logro del bien común y a la salvaguarda de toda la vida y del ambiente que la sustenta. As heritage professionals, when we look for solutions to the challenges of climate change, we must adapt our own approaches and look not for perhaps reaching for traditional engineering, hard engineering solutions, but looking for sustainable, low carbon and nature-based solutions. Los museos no somos ajenos al mundo en que vivimos. Nuestro mundo está cambiando día a día. Y ese cambio no es ajeno a nuestro accionar. El cambio climático ha generado estragos irreversibles. Las actividades humanas en pos de un progreso basado en el consumo han favorecido el avance del cambio climático. Aunque sus efectos nos parezcan lejanos e improbables, la realidad es que los padecemos con frecuencia. Climate change constitutes a significant threat, but also fresh impetus to utilize cultural heritage for the purposes of adaptation and to renew appreciation for diverse local cultural identities. Nuestra sociedad de consumo representa una amenaza a los recursos naturales y culturales de nuestro planeta. Uno de los principales problemas que queda por resolver es el impacto que estamos teniendo sobre los elementos patrimoniales. Debemos ser conscientes de su presencia y asumir un rol activo frente a la realidad innegable del cambio climático. Toda pequeña acción cuenta. I invite everybody to get into our boat and row together further, faster, together. We can do this.
Okay, so everyone, the launch is uh, tomorrow. Mañana es el lanzamiento, so don't, please don't miss it. And the, thank you, Mauro, for, for sharing this um, moment with us. Gracias, Mauro, por compartir este momento con nosotros. And now to finalize, I would like to give the floor to uh, the ECOMOS focal point for the Sustainable Development Goals, um, el punto focal del ECOMOS para los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, eh, EJ Gil Dream. The floor is yours. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you, Ona. Uh, muchas gracias. Um, thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, so I will um, try to be brief and um, do my uh, duty as wrapping up um, our webinar um, as the outgoing uh, SDG's focal point um, and uh, reiterating thanks to our organizing team and everybody who's here with us and our great speakers um, and the contributions over, over the questions that um, all together. Um, so <clears throat> I'd like to go back um, to the beginning of how we um, conceived these webinar series um, based on the five P's of the SDGs and the uh, Agenda 2030. Um, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. So we structured this one around uh, uh, the uh, planet uh, pillar, so to speak. Um, but uh, as with the last webinar, we um, eventually automatically came to the importance of the people. Um, pillar. You know, we are always um, looking at the relationships um, of between planet and people and the way we have our relations with the earth. Um, so uh, a few points that I uh, captured uh, just to uh, echo here again today uh, from, from the conversations um, can be summarized as, uh, let's see, well, uh, speaking about the um, the cultural na na natural divide and how um, this is an artificial divide and uh, the culture nature journeys and uh, it's really indeed a journey of transformation for us in, in our own thinking and, and practices. It's, uh, that's really true. And um, going back to something Andrew said at the beginning and again to the whole origins of the environmental sustainability literature in the mid 20th century. Remember we had the um, publication Limits to Growth and uh, Andrew mentioned um, the clash of our insatiable human needs and the limited uh, planetary resources. And um, here, um, I think it was uh, Gandhi's words uh, saying, there is enough um, on this planet for everybody's needs, but not enough for, everybody, for people's greeds. So maybe this uh, transition back from the greed to the uh, need um, paradigm is something that we are on the journey toward. And the realization that we are part of the ecosystem, we are um, a, a natural um, organisms ourselves and our place in the natural world um, is not so different from all our fellow or living organisms. And um, linking culture and nature, um, the landscape approach absolutely is really key and we keep going back and back to it at different scales. And this includes both um, inhabited human um, areas and um, human settlements and um, cities um, like in Nupur's um, presentation to uninhabited uh, wilder areas like the one in Chris's presentation, um, underwater oceans, the vastness um, um, of, the, of the ocean's universe. It, it's all one continuum in, in that respect. Um, uh, moving on uh, to my points, the intangible heritage, the, this heritage of uh, living more in harmony with nature, um, why the traditional knowledge is referred to um, so many um, times again, um, is, um, is a guiding force for us. And um, also uh, cosmology and the spiritual values were mentioned. I, I think this is also a very interesting source of inspiration for us. Looking at the ancient um, co cosmic belief systems of you know, human societies, we look at these elements, you know, the four elements of nature, water is one of them, and when it's out of balance, you have floods and droughts, droughts. and climate change is about the, the loss of that equilibrium, that stability uh, between how um, elements should flow, um, the equilibrium, is the, up, the balance is upset, and now we are um, trying to adapt ourselves to these accelerating changes, so maybe we can draw inspiration from uh, these uh, philosophies um, that are inherent in in our uh, cultural heritage practices. Um, uh, other than that, um, coming to the politics of it, finally, um, 
I would like to reiterate um, what was mentioned about um, the importance of um, data, but um, also the knowledge we have, the, be it academic knowledge or um, positive sciences, social sciences, qualitative, quantitative knowledge. Maybe in the natural sciences, we can rely more um, on, on uh, quantifiable data perhaps, but uh, we have this general issue of translating our knowledge and data into real change, real action. And here we mentioned um, both uh, the way that um, policy and high level and boxy kind of rigid formal structures um, are at play, but also the opposite of that, you know, people, uh, the informal, the human, the, the grassroots level. And we, need, we always need both of these actually. Um, and they need to be in, in, at interplay. And I think uh, the nature um, approach, the environmental planet pillar, this was a great platform to, to discuss um, how we're going to transcend these. Um, so uh, I think those points are enough from me and uh, thank you so much uh, for your attendance and another lively, well attended, uh, well contributed webinar. So as Gabe said, uh, we will have the next one uh, soon and uh, say, stay safe. Every ah, I'm sorry, just one more point about COVID. Um, you know, we should really go, um, we, we, we realize we cannot stop where we are with SDG 6, 7, um, 13, 14, 15, because we should have perhaps talked about SDG 3 and 2 and how the climate crisis and the food security crisis and uh, the wildlife habitat and uh, zoonotic diseases crises, these are all interlinked. So it's very difficult to draw the lines, you know, where, where how we formulate uh, these boxes in the SDGs. So thank you again. Gracias, Ege. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. We made it. Can you imagine we made it? And I will leave you with the final slide on how, and I hope I make it right this time, how you can get in touch with us. Conectense con nosotros. More information on Facebook, more information on the website, and also you can contact Ege uh, to the Ecomos email. So let's keep in touch, let's keep connected, sigamos conectados y hasta la próxima. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much. <laughs>